My experience was that the medications were um, as disabling as the disorder was. I was 17 years old and a senior in high school. I had an acute psychotic break and um, within relatively short order my family um, put me in a mental hospital and um, basically at the time I was told I had schizophrenia. I was told that I needed to retire from life, that I needed to avoid stress, that I needed simply to take large doses of antipsychotic medications for the rest of my life and basically retire from living at the ripe old age of 17 years old. Um, for me, that was a prognosis of doom. Um, but in the beginning, um, you know, I, I was young and I said, well, they're the doctors, they know, right? So this sounds serious. You know, I'd seen one flew over the cuckoo's nest and I was like, whoa, they, they, they're saying this is what it's all going to be about for me. And every week I would go in to see the psychiatrist and he'd say, you're taking your meds? And I'd say, I'm taking the meds. And he said, good, you're doing good for a schizophrenic. Um, and it just kind of shows you what very low expectations they had for me in my life. And finally, I kind of got up the guts and I said, what, what's wrong with me? What do I have, you know? And then he went into this sort of rap that just sort of flowed and he said, you have a disease uh, called schizophrenia. It's a disease that's a lot like diabetes, just like a diabetic is gonna have to take medications for the rest of their life. You're gonna have to take psychiatric meds, antipsychotics for the rest of your life. Maybe you can cope. I really wanna encourage you to go into this halfway house and as he was going on about that, um, I felt uh, the, the ember of something just sort of flare up inside of me. And uh, I call that moment just one of angry indignation because at the heart of that word indignation is the word dignity. I felt it come up and just something inside of me was just going, no, you are wrong about me, you are wrong about me. But by then I was pretty socialized into the role of being a mental patient. So I didn't speak up, you know, for fear that, you know, they'd put me back in the hospital or something, you know, raise my meds. Instead, I went out into the corridor after the appointment and I remember just, you're wrong about me. And I'm saying this to myself and then this thought comes into my head and the thought is, in fact, you're so wrong that I'm going to become Dr. Deegan and I'm going to change the mental health system so no one ever gets hurt in it again. And, you know, it's not like the clouds opened up and the angels came down from on high and I was, you know, on my way. In fact, um, absolutely nothing from the outside changed. But inside, I experienced this kind of turning point where now I knew what I needed to do. But it wasn't enough, you know. It needed to be followed by some kind of action. So the way that happened for me is I had this little Irish grandmother who lived with our family growing up. And she would come in every day to the room where I sat, and she, we were smoking my cigarettes and stuff, and she would say, Patricia, would you like to go food shopping? And I would say, no. She'd say, Patricia, and she'd come in the next day, Patricia, would you like to go food shopping? And every day. And I should have caught on, because she would come in on Sundays when the grocery stores weren't open. But she was a wise old woman, and she said, uh, every day she would invite me. And one day, months down the road, for reasons I can't tell you why, I said yes adding the caveat that I'd only, you know, push the cart, uh, wouldn't put anything in it. <laughs> but uh, that was actually the first active step I took in my recovery, pushing a, a grocery cart down, down the aisle of a grocery store. Um, and I learned, it dawned on me like, oh yeah, if I'm gonna become Dr. Deegan and change the mental health system so no one ever gets hurt in it again, maybe I should think about trying out college. <laughs> you know, oh yeah. Uh, so I took one course at a local community college, went to the hospital in the middle of that semester, um, got back out, um, came back to class. I just kept at it, you know. I struggled a lot with distressing voices. Nobody was talking about recovery at the time. Um, and uh, so all I knew was I, I had this call and I was saying yes to it, I was, I was gonna keep going. And I would bring a tape recorder, the old analog tape recorders with me, you know, a Sony Walkman, and put one of those receivers on it and record the lectures and when I felt better uh, in the, later in the day, um, maybe be able to comprehend some of it. My goal in sitting in a class was just to get through it without freaking out, you know? Um, and, uh, but slowly but surely, it was like um, practice and trying out different things, 
of how not to freak out and how to stay attuned and how to pay attention and concentrate again when my mind would be running. So, um, you know, slowly but surely I, I did it. I, I did become Dr. Deegan and got a doctorate in clinical psychology and, and, uh, and that's how I got into the mental health field. <laughs> a bit of a story.